So, so I'm just going to give you kind of uh, a flavor of how SACS has been used in modeling since, you know, I've, I started doing uh, bio sex. Um, so this is kind of a summary of a lot of work that's out there, work that I've done and, and others. Uh, but brief review from yesterday, um, you know, when you do SACS, we have what we call model independent analysis. So this is where if you measure your SACS data, you can, you can easily extract the radius gyration. There's two ways to get this. One is in reciprocal space um, based measurement using the Guinea approximation. And the other one's a real space method where it's based on the P of R distribution. And what you're doing here is just taking the, the second moment of the P of R distribution. Um, and to emphasize here, this, is, this uses all of the data that you use in the P of R transform, whereas the Guinea, you're gonna use about 10% of the data. Um, once you kind of have your RG and I0 determined, then you could look at what's called the normalized cracky plot. And so this readily identifies compact globular uh, states. So we have this little crosshair here, if you remember at the square root of three, 1.1. 1 .1. Um, and so this, this is a convenient way to kind of visually uh, assess your thermodynamic state. We also had the proid uh, exponent. Uh, this, this is a quantitative uh, measure of, of you know, flexibility, but it's best to use a comparative, like if you're adding a, a ligand or taking something away. Um, the exponent should be near 3.7 to four for something that's well folded. Three is uh, uh, likely flexible and an exponent of two is unfolded. Uh, we could also extract the particle volume. So remember, this is based on I0, uh, requires that Polaroid invariant, right? So you need a folded compact particle. And you, know, you, you essentially take the extrapolated value at I0, divide by Q to get your uh, Polaroid volume. And this is an apparent volume. It will overestimate uh, the mass of your particle, especially if something is uh, partially unfolded or flexible. Um, if you uh, take your SACS data, and, 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 and recover the P of R distribution, you'll also get the, the maximum dimension of the particle. As we said yesterday, this is an iterative process. Usually, uh, and what you're looking for is a smooth uh, distribution and you can determine the, the maximum dimension of your particle. So um, after you do all this, this is what we, we call the model independent analysis. So this is all the stuff you wanna do before you go to the next step. Uh, you know, the next step is to do structural modeling, right? So whether it's going to be atomistic modeling or ab initio modeling, uh, going through this first helps you determine the Q-min uh, and, and Q-max of your data set, which is going to be really important for the, for the subsequent steps. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a little out of place, but uh, if you remember yesterday too, when we talked about the P of R distribution, you have to divide uh, the distribution up into bins. Um, <clears throat> the, the bin width, we said, is, is this relationship where you take pi and divide it by Q max. So as Q max gets, gets larger, you have more and more bins. And that's uh, simply because Q max is, is measured in reciprocal space. So this question in, in, in modeling in SACS is, is uh, uh, you know, resolution always, always comes up, right? So if you remember in the early days of cryo EM, um, when you had a cryo EM structure, it was this, these really smooth structures. And then what you saw over the years is the resolution or the data quality was improving, the increase in resolution, you start to really see features in, in these electron density maps. Um, but we don't get that in sex. We, in ab initio modeling, you don't, you don't start to see improvements in the, in the, in the, in the blob right, in, in, t in terms of the fact that you start to get something like this. So, you know, really you got to think about why is that? And hopefully we'll uh, go over that in a few slides. Um, and then atomistic modeling, it's the same problem. At best, you might get a 28 in resolution, even though you're fitting in, in atomistic modeling. What we mean by that is that, you know, if you take a whole bunch of models, fit it to the SACS data, you'll have a lot of answers which, which will describe the SACS data, but they could vary quite significantly. Um, and I think, I think the thing is with, with the atomistic model, it has, it has the potential to be four to eight inks from resolution. It's going to require very high quality data sets out the high Q, but you, you fundamentally need a better SACS calculator. And I think to kind of show you this point here is um, 
This is uh, uh, by a group called uh, Chen and Hub who do a lot of molecular dynamics. This is uh, aquaporin in a DDM micelle. Um, they did a bunch of MD simulations. And then they also uh, compared programs like Chrysol, Fox's, Aquasax, Wax's, which is their version. Um, and so the, the scattering of an empty DDM micelle looks like this. It's got a big hump in it. But what you can see here is like if you use Chrysol to fit this, this micelle, it's terrible. Right, you, you're looking at a resolution of like 0 0.007, and then the whole thing kind of falls apart. You know, Foxes does better, but it, it's still it, this this high resolution information or this high IQ information. Um, the, the fit is quite poor. Aquasax is even worse. Um, and then you know, with their program, it does better out here, but it's really failing to capture. Um, this this valley here. So, so you know the differences are that with with foxes and Chrysol is that you have an implicit solvent model. The the Chrysol solvent model is is kind of this border layer model. Uh, foxes uses um, uh, modifications of uh, atomic scattering form factors based on surface accessibility. And then you have things like Aquasax and Waxes, which use these explicit solvent models. But the problem with Waxes, it's really parameterized at a high level. So. Um, they're using like something like a seven eggs from border layer model. Uh, but anyways, the sax calculator can lead to incorrect models. There's still room for improvement. So fundamentally what you need to do is once you do your fitting, you really have to think about if you're doing atomistic modeling, how can I test that model, right? What's, what's an independent way for me to validate uh, that model? Okay, so we'll see more of this in a bit. So sax modeling, when we talk about uh, ab initio modeling, uh, in the 1970s, you had uh, these phase retrieval methods uh, pioneered by Heinrich Sturman, um, and then it kind of like died down because everybody got into crystallography and stuff. Um, and then there's kind of this revival of this technique, uh, largely with XFEL, uh, driven by XFEL, but we have uh, contributions from Peter Zvort, Henry Chapman, and, and, and lately Thomas Grant using DENS. So DENS is, is, a, is a flavor of a phase retrieval uh, method that applies to biosex. And then we have these ab initio methods. So we have, um, it started with Pablo Cachon. Uh, he wrote a program in 1998. And then a year later, uh, that kind of inspired Sphergen to, to write Damon and Damif and Gasbord and Monza. And then you had Seb Doniak down at Stanford put, put out a program that briefly lived and died off. And then you had uh, Zwart and uh, his group at the ALS write a program called Shape Up. So we're gonna go over the ab initio stuff first here. Um, so, what, what shape up was it was just simply uh, doing a large um, uh, survey of all the structures in the PDB, uh, calculating uh, the parameterizing using these three D Zernica polynomials, um, relating everything down to a unit sphere, and so simply you would just take your SACS data, uh, search their library, find the closest matches, and do some minor refinement of that. Uh, to get to get your uh, uh, blob. So at the end of the day, what you're getting is a blob. Um, they took this one step further now. I think last year, they, they used more uh, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to, to kind of uh, search uh, shape space and, and do some matches with refinement. And so this is available online. Uh, you can just upload your data and out comes a the shape. There's uh, another method. Uh, so this is in the UK. Uh, it's by uh, Christopher Pryor. He's a mathematician up in, um, I think, Dundee. Uh, and this is this is a neat model. So what he's doing here is he looked at how all the all the chains. If you if you kind of like a think of a polypeptide chain um, as as a, a not free structure, he's he's able to apply some uh, clever maths from from uh, his field of knot theory to to kind of search. Uh, not space, right? Uh, based on the Ramachandra restrictions, and and he could take like um, SACS data. So this is using th theoretical SACS data, um, and and recover, you know, a connected shape, uh, which kind of matches the PDB structure here. And he did that in this case for uh, these really small proteins. And now he's he's kind of trying to scale it up to to do something as large as BSA um, with inputs from uh, secondary structure. It's a really neat method, uh, but it takes a long time to do anything bigger than like lysozyme. But I think um, uh, they're, they're working out this year how to kind of speed up those calculations. 
So Dan's is his phase retrieval uh, algorithm by, by Thomas Grant. So he was an Excel guy and then decided to try and apply some of this to SACS. And what you're doing here is you're defining a space uh, based on Dmax. We get that from the P of R distribution. Um, and then you just randomly guess electron density values in this space, um, calculate intensities. Uh, for each Q value that you measure, you determine scale factor to kind of rescale the data. And uh, you then go back, calculate your, your uh, real space electron density again, apply a, a mask, right? So you say everything above a certain value. I'm just going to draw like a convex shape around it, uh, flatten everything outside of it, and just keep going around in circles in this calculation. And surprisingly, it converges. Um, and so, so this was uh, published in 2018. Uh, here, here's some, some examples he was showing. But what's, what's neat that what you're seeing in the literature is people are using these density maps that he's calculating uh, to do rigid body refinement, to drive rigid body refinement. So they're using programs like uh, uh, Phoenix Refine or CCP4 to take low resolution, uh, calling this a low resolution map, and then trying to just kind of uh, drive uh, better, better fits to the SACS data. Um, you do not want to use your raw SACS data here. You must use a smooth data set. So if you go to his website now, you can upload your data set and they'll smooth it out for you. Um, if you use the data sets, the answer won't converge as well. But if, this is all in this paper. Uh, you, you, prefer, you typically perform greater than 20 runs and then you'll average it. Uh, do not trust AutoNome for this. Um, you want to, because AutoNome tends to, tends to truncate the data severely and underestimate Dmax, so you really want to manually run GNOME, and you want to use that GNOME output file for model. But like I said, he's got a new method now where he doesn't use GNOME, he, he actually uses the more method for the P of R distribution. Uh, this is a phase retrieval algorithm uh, developed by Peter Zwartz group uh, back in uh, 2015. And so what they did is they took this uh, shape here with these three uh, voids in it, One's rectangular, one's like a cube, and the other one's kind of like an egg. Uh, and then you calculate the SACS data, and then he uh, applied his uh, phase retrieval algorithm to it. And you can kind of see that you get, you know, the, approximately the right kind of shape, but the voids are all um, uh, incorrect. And, and what he was doing here was thinking about if you apply additional SACS data in terms of fluctuation X-ray scattering, uh, how much do you need to actually add back until you actually recover uh, the the correct uh, uh, distribution of the voids in in the shape? You know, and this is this is really neat because it, it shows you like you know kind of the slow you know low resolution small angle X ray scattering data. If you collect it correctly, you can recover some very interesting information. But uh, right now, this is not typically applied to biosacs because it works in theory, um, and a lot of times the actual data. Um, you can't see this, the features you need above the background. Okay, so when you think about doing ab initio modeling, this is, this is GROEL, uh, Cryo-EM structure 2001, and this is, this is kind of the, the, the uh, uh, resolution of that structure, right? And then this is today using a SACS calculator that I wrote that you can calculate. But, you know, you got to look at it and think about, you know, what are you really trying to learn here? You know, what, what scientific question is being addressed by, you know, recovering a shape like that? I, I don't see, you know, how you can drive a hypothesis that's going to be testable just by looking at some blob with some nice features in it. I think, I think what happens is, you know, as you start to have little models that you can put in it and start to arrange, maybe this is better as, as a guide to, to think about how to, how to make uh, larger, larger uh, aggregates or structures to test. Because then you could be thinking about, well, maybe I'm guessing at this interface. Does this interface make sense? Can I test that in solution? Um, and so uh, the way ab initio modeling works is um, what we do is we define a search volume. Uh, we fill it with a bunch of dummy atoms. So this is hexagonal close pack lattice. Um, and then you just randomly grab a bunch uh, test it against the SACS data, and one by one, you you move it. You know, does it work? Does it improve the fit or not? If it doesn't, um, you know, move to a next one, and you keep going around in circles doing this, uh, you know, cooling, because it's usually simulated annealing. And at the end of the day, you'll recover a shape, and this is the shape of glucose isomerase with, with symmetry imposed. So modeling depends greatly on the quality of the SACS data. Like we're saying, when you do ab initial modeling, 
It's going to largely be driven by, by the low Q information. So you want to make sure that you have minimal errors in that, um, accurate mass constraints, and also how the algorithm is going to be implemented. Uh, and so, you know, ab initio, so we call this ab initio volumetric modeling. You typically want to perform, uh, you know, uh, 10 to 15 independent runs. I'd like to do 20, you know. Um, your programs, that, the popular ones are Damif and Gasbor. Uh, uh, so, the, you know, Sybils has a website where, where you just upload the data, set the number of runs, and it takes care of it all for you. Um, the inputs for these are the, are the GNOME out files. And so this usually just specifies the, the, the DMAX for that search space. And at the end of the day, when you do all these modeling runs, they have to be independent of each other. You average them together. And you want to look at what's called the normalized spatial discrepancy. And what this does is it tells you how different each model is from each other. And they should be close, you know, relatively the same. If, if, they, if the NSD is quite high, that usually means that the simulated annealing run is too short and you should lengthen. Um, okay, so the difference between Gasbor, Damif, and Monza is that modeling uh, for Damif and Damif is it's, it's restricted to the volume of the particle, whereas Gasbor, the modeling is going to be restricted to the number of residues. So this is kind of a mass constraint. Uh, chi here is meaningless. You always get a perfect fit at the end of the day. So you really want to look at the NSD of the set of runs. They should be similar. For Gasbor, Chi will be, should be low. Uh, it won't be as meaningless. Uh, so flexible or underestimated masses will have uh, high chi values, right? So if, if you underestimate the mass, you, you know, you're not going to fit the data too well. And this is a problem with it. So if you look at xylanase here, this is a sac state of xylanase. I use DAMIF, I get this shape. I use GASBOR, I get this shape. Uh, this is average of 10 different runs, uh, very different shape. So you're like, well, you know, what does that tell me? I have no idea. You know, I just get this little, you know, round looking thing. I don't know what to do with that, right? So you really have to think about how to use this in a way that can drive your science and test. Um, and so this was a, a funny paper that came out or a situation I was in where I was one of the um, external reviewers for, for uh, DENS when it came out. And, and um, there was this uh, little fight going on between the reviewers. And so, so the question was like, you know, how do you, how do you know you got a shape that's correct, right? And it comes down to this thing of like, you know, what, what are the limitations of the homogeneous body? So when we, when we do these calculations with like Damage for Gasbor, uh, we have this homogeneous body assumption, meaning that, you know, given the shape that if you take a cross section of it, the electrons, that density through it doesn't vary, right? It's constant. Um, and so what they were showing here was if you, if you calculated the SACS profiles for each of these shapes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, all the way to I, uh, calculated SACS profile, they all fit the data equally well, right? And, and they look really different, right? Um, and so, so you, know, you know, would Gasbor do any better? I mean, these, these artifacts are due to the assumptions that are made uh, in the calculation. How do you tell a false positive? So the way, the way you can think about it is just simply looking at the P of R distribution because these things will have different distribution functions. And when we compare a shape like this to this one, even though they would have uh, similar SACS profiles based on that homogeneous body approximation, you can see the P of R distributions are completely different. So this tells you right there alone, there's, there's limitations to that homogeneous body, right? Um, and we should be really careful with how we interpret um, uh, these ab initio model runs. Um, Probably, okay. Can, can we interrupt you or you want to? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I have a question. So this is exactly the problem what do you, I mean, our users and everybody in the SACS code need to know. And so when you calculate uh, a SACS curve using SACS calculator from the atomic structure that you show, they are also very different. So it's not mm -hmm. only the problem that you have the, the homogeneous beads or homogeneous body calculated sex profile is equal. It's just the information and constraint from atomic structure is different and calculation of those profiles different using sex calculator, using atomic structures. And they need to be keeping in mind too. The ab initio shape yeah, yeah, absolutely. different calculators. Yeah, the, if, you, if you calculated, if you took the sign, the, the sign transform of, of these distributions, uh, to calculate an intensity profile, these would be different, right? So that pathway, there's a pathway, it's so weird. 
Um, but that, you know, again, that just tells you there's lots of room for improvement here. Um, the program I do like to use a lot uh, is Monza. And, and um, that's because I think you can actually drive some science behind it, right? So this is where you're doing this ab initio modeling of mixed phases. And a phase in this case, it just means like, you know, if there's a protein A and protein B, you know, phase A, phase B, that's what it's referring to. So it's some difference and they just call it a phase. Um, and what you need to know here is roughly the volume of the phases. So if you're going to be modeling a complex, you want to know uh, the, the, the particle volume for each phase or each subunit. Um, and so this requires SAC state of a complex and of the individual components. Um, and this is something that's easy to, to do now with, with um, uh, sex sex. And if you don't know, if, and, and you don't need to measure all the, all the individual components, you could have one of two if you're doing a binary, um, but it helps to have, have, have all of them. And so there's a, there's a so I, what I like to do is set up a table here. I do an RG, the volume of correlation, the volume of the of, uh, volume, uh, the mass and D max. And so for each component or each phase, I just try to fill this out as much as I can because this will become input uh, for Monza, right? Because at the end of the day, what we want to try and do is, is give Monza constraints on how, how what the RG is of the components uh, of the whole thing and of each, each uh, partial volume. And so in this case, with, with this protein RNA complex, uh, we had uh, data of the complex and of the protein alone and of the RNA alone. And I'm able to, to model these separately and see that the RNA, the small little RNA is binding towards the center of mass of the particle. Um, and that's a neat way to kind of visualize, you know, where, where the RNA is binding with respect to the protein. I could guess at that because I remember, you know, I could see that the RG shrink a lot when, when, the, when the RNA balance suggesting that it was binding in the center. But this is, again, a, a good way to kind of visualize that change. But this was a good example we did at Sybils where we had a protein DNA complex. Uh, we measured sacs of the protein alone and the DNA alone. And the way that we did the experiment was this was a, a um, had a Walker AB motif of bind, bound ATP. So then we, we did it in the presence of ADP beryllium fluoride and AMP PMP. This mimics the pre hydrolysis state and this mimics the post hydrolysis state. And what we could see using Monza is that in the post hydrolysis state or pre hydrolysis state is that the protein is, is on one end of the DNA. And then when it hydrolyzes the, the ATP, it, it wraps itself along the DNA. And this, the function of this protein was to facilitate annealing of DNA. And so this kind of, you know, suggested a mechanism, you know, hugs it more to kind of facilitate the, the uh, uh, annealing of the DNA. This is another one where we had a, a protein P65 with maltose binding protein uh, purification tag on it. And I asked the users at the time to send me the uh, samples of with and without the tag. And then we could just simply see how the tag is sitting with respect to the whole protein. Very easy to do. You know, um, like I say, you do sex sacs, this is two runs, right? Um, this is another one with RNA. So this is a large RNA here. And we, we did the sacs with and without uh, the stem two, six kilodalton mass difference. And so uh, using Monza, I can, I can kind of work out where the stem two is. So I can kind of stick my model of stem two in it. And then with that, I can then arrange the center of masses uh, with respect to, to the uh, a larger unfolded RNA, and then use molecular dynamics to, to drive uh, uh, the center of mass of each helix into the, into the positions and show that the uh, RNA is collapsed in solution. Um, so that's kind of an easy way to do it. So uh, words of caution, uh, when you do Monza, I, I really suggest that you try to restrict yourself to two uh, and not model anything more. And so what happens here is with this case, we had a three component system. Um, you have a protein, T box, tRNA, and tRNA. And so I simulated the data for, for each of these, ran Monza, and it failed to correctly place the phases in all 15 runs. So the protein was being you know, moved in the center. It was really kind of fitting the noise when it should be down here. And then the tRNA was either here or here. So I couldn't distinguish the two. But what happens is if you kind of restrict this to a binary system where you go, okay, look, in this one case with the data, I'm just going to focus on where the tRNA is, or in this case, I'm going to focus where the protein is, you have better results. And in this case, when we redid the runs, it correctly placed the tRNA um, with respect to the, the T box and the protein. And then with the protein, because it's so small, 
Um, we looked at, uh, we did 13, uh, 12 runs here, nine out of nine out of the 12 runs it correctly positioned where the protein is. And in the other three cases, it put it here. So, uh, you know, you can kind of accept the false positive behavior uh, and look at the median location or location with the highest density of where it was placing the protein. Um, Five minutes. And this is, okay, and this is just another example of, again, protein RNA complex. In this case, the, the users uh, thought they were working with a monomeric form of the RNA for years. Uh, you know, we collected the SAC data with and without the RNA, and we could show that the RNA was dimerizing and that's what they're setting up the crystal trades on. Okay, that's basically it. Oh, this is another example. Um, Monza again. So this was a, a good one where they had um, uh, uh, collected collected the sac state of this protein with and without the uh, MVP tags, and they used that to kind of figure out how how the two proteins were coming together, whether it was N to N, uh, N to N, or C to C, or N to C. Uh, and then they used this to then drive uh, the construction of a larger, uh, low-resolution cryo structure. Okay, 